Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Eric Hauge, Executive Director of Homeline, and you're joining us today. Thank you for joining us on Wednesday, June 17th at 1.30 for our uh, weekly COVID-19 pandemic tenant landlord legal and rental issue related uh, webinar. We've been doing these every week since uh, mid to late April, and we will continue to as long as there is interest. Um, today we're joined by uh, managing, Homeline's managing attorney, Michael Bra, who will be doing the presentation and uh, we'll be talking about the recent extension of the peacetime emergency, answering some questions that were submitted in advance and happy to answer any questions that participants uh, send in via the Q&A chat or the chat system. Uh, sorry, trying to get my PowerPoint thing running here. All right, um, so just a reminder what Homeline is. We are a statewide nonprofit organization. We've advised quarter over a quarter million tenants, uh, rental uh, households since we opened. And we advise tenants about rental issues in four languages, English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. And uh, with that, I am going to uh, hand it over to Mike, who will start our presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, and today, I'm guessing 15, 20 minutes of me talking at the beginning, talking about where we are with the eviction moratorium, things like that. Uh, we, Eric mentioned we have a couple of questions that have been submitted already, but we should have ample time to answer uh, virtually any question you might have about landlord-tenant law whether it's COVID-19 specific related, which is kind of what these webinars are designed for, but uh, certainly happy to answer questions about other landlord topics, landlord tenant legal topics, uh, if you have them. Uh, and today's a good chance to do that because we should have, like I said, plenty of time uh, near the end where we can answer those questions. We're here for an hour. Um, and like I said, we have about 30, 35 minutes worth of stuff with the questions that we already have submitted probably in advance uh, and so hopefully we can get to your questions but let's start with uh, I guess this is the big news although it seems a little anticlimactic after uh, I'm guessing most of you already know this but I'll cover it anyway the last week when we had this session we weren't sure that the governor was going to be extending the moratorium on evictions that has of course happened um, the previous deadline was set to expire on um, Friday, June 12th, but I believe it was Thursday that the governor officially announced that he was going to be extending the peacetime emergency declaration, which is the key question when it comes to evictions. Evictions, the moratorium on evictions in Minnesota is tied to the peacetime emergency declaration, not to any of the shelter in place orders that we've been seeing. Again, just so we're clear about the terminology that we're talking about here, we've seen all these dials uh, on social media, uh, in the newspaper, that talk about things that can open, restaurants, movie theaters, gyms, things like that, and you know how much they can be open. Like, can a restaurant have full seating or is it half seating, that, that sort of thing. Uh, th those shelter-in-place type orders are not tied to the same time frame as the peacetime emergency declaration which is what the eviction moratorium is tied to. So that runs concurrently with that, the declaration of the peacetime emergency. That started in mid-March. The governor renewed that in mid-April, renewed it again in mid-May, and renewed it just officially Friday. Uh, along with that renewal, the governor um, called a special session, which is what's required under the statute for the peacetime emergency declaration, uh, if the extension happens when the legislature is not in session and they were out of session at that point. So that's why we have a special session that was actually immediately triggered when the governor announced the peacetime emergency declaration. So just to focus in on evictions for a second, uh, how that works under the peacetime emergency declaration and the governor's ban and more uh, on, on evictions at, at present. And this has been true since mid March. Uh, a landlord effectively can't file an eviction uh, for the, the normal things that landlords typically file evictions for. Uh, Non-payment of rent is well over 90% of all evictions filed in Minnesota, but other things like an unauthorized occupant, a boyfriend or a girlfriend moving in, 
somebody gets a pet when they're not supposed to have a pet, those kind of breaches of the lease. Uh, and if we put all those together, then we're close to 96, 97, 98% of all evictions. Uh, the only reason a landlord can file an eviction right now is if the tenant either seriously endangers people on the property. Uh, and there was a slight tweak. We talked about this um, last week on, on the session that we had where the governor had changed it. It's not just endangering other tenants on the premises. That was the old rule. Uh, but now it says endangering others. So that would be the landlord or their employees, um, delivery person, anybody. Uh, anyhow, so if the tenant endangers, seriously endangers others on the premises, or uh, if the tenant violates a specific statute, here we have it marked 504B.171. There's a list of things that count as these unlawful activities, uh, possession of illegal gu uh, guns, sawed off shotguns, automatic weapons, uh, illegal drugs, any amount of any illegal drug, and there's a list, uh, stolen property or prostitution. If any of that happens in the property, then the landlord can file an eviction now. The eviction moratorium wouldn't apply if they ser the tenant is seriously endangering others or they violate 504B.171. 504B, of course, is the landlord-tenant chapter of Minnesota law. Almost all landlord-tenant laws that you find in a statute are found in that chapter, 504B. The landlord must also not terminate the tenancy uh, during the pendency of the emergency. So this has been a, uh, an issue that's come up uh, since the order was issued. Uh, what we know for sure is that a landlord can't enforce a notice or a non-renewal or a notice to quit or a notice to vacate, however they want to phrase it, for a time during the peacetime emergency declaration. So if a landlord gave a notice for a tenant to vacate by May 31st, they gave it in April or even March, which would be pretty common practice, then the uh, notice to vacate time is May 31. The tenant's supposed to be gone, but what if the tenant doesn't go? On June 1, the landlord's prior remedy, prior to COVID-19, would be to go file an eviction, unlawful detainer, UD, they're all the same thing, for something called holding over, is what it would be called. But this eviction moratorium clearly does not allow an eviction for that purpose. Uh, and we believe and we continue to get more and more support from the Attorney General's office, which is the party that really matters for this question, as they're tasked with enforcing these rules. Uh, we believe that a landlord giving a notice today for some time after the peacetime emergency declaration has ended is uh, violating the statute as well, or not statute, I'm sorry, this executive order. Uh, so if a landlord gives a notice today, June 17th, for the end of July, uh, or for the end of August, but they actually hand the tenant the piece of paper today saying you got to go at this time, that that is terminating the residential lease during the pendency of the emergency. Uh, and the Attorney General's office seems to be backing that up. They're sending letters off to landlords saying, hey, this is a violation. Uh, so conservative advice, again, I'm a tenant lawyer and our office only advises renters. Uh, we do give a speech once a week tomorrow uh, at 1.30. We'll be talking to landlords and property managers. Uh, but that's about as much as we're doing with landlords. We give speeches. We actually created a book that we sell to landlords. Um, but we don't advise uh, individually, specifically landlords. We do advise tenants. Uh, but if I were a landlord lawyer, I would be cautiously, conservatively advising them that uh, you should not give a notice to vacate right now uh, for a time when you think the peacetime emergency declaration might end. Two reasons. Number one, the peacetime emergency declaration, we don't know when it will end. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but we can't be sure until it actually happens. The other thing is it looks like it's a violation of the governor's order in the attorney general's office, as I say, has been uh, coming around to that line of thinking and acting more on it. I think when, when the original eviction moratorium was announced, they were completely flooded with the concept of landlords actually trying to file evictions or even change the locks on tenants since that was their focus. But now they're getting more of these uh, calls where a landlord is given a future notice to vacate and they're taking more action there. One thing that the uh, eviction moratorium does not do it does not take away the responsibility or the, the debt that a tenant owes rent. The rent is still due. Clearly stated in the governor's order, that's been consistent since mid-March. That's never changed. We get asked about uh, rent cancellations and, and rent strikes fairly regularly. 
there's no law that supports a tenant doing that. I understand sort of the social trend that might be going in that direction that, that, that we see it a lot on social media from all around the country or even around the world that tenants shouldn't have to pay rent, but actually enacting laws saying that tenants don't have to pay rent, that's a different level. We certainly don't have that in Minnesota. Uh, and I haven't seen it much of anywhere in the country actually so far. But anyhow, let's talk about, if you could go to the next slide, Eric. The uh, how long will this last question, which is always the question that, that we deal with is, when can a landlord file an eviction? Landlords care about this a lot because they want to know when they can reclaim possession of their property so they can rent it to somebody else who isn't paying if they have people that aren't paying. Tenants want to know about this. If they aren't able to afford to pay, how long do I have before I'm really in danger of losing my home? So the state moratorium, and we'll talk about the federal one in a second, but the state moratorium goes through, this was the one that was announced Friday, goes through July 13th. So mid-July uh, is when the latest peacetime emergency declaration expires. Now, can it be extended? Can the landlord or the governor renew that again? Yes. Uh, under the statute, it looks like the governor is allowed to do that sort of in perpetuity as long as either the legislature is in session or, as I mentioned earlier, there's an automatic trigger and a special session restart. So I guess in theory, we could see a sp if, if the, uh, the Senate and the House, the Minnesota Senate and the House adjourn um, without any sort of deal struck between them and the governor and the governor decides to declare a peacetime emergency again on July 13th, then a special session would automatically be triggered again. The legislature does not have the power to, I guess, stop a special session from occurring, but they can end it whenever they wish to. Uh, the governor has the power to declare a special session at any time, but they can't end it. So each branch of government has their own rules and powers, responsibilities, however you want to phrase it, that they're entitled to use. Uh, and so, the, the declaration of the peacetime emergency can be extended in one of two ways. Either the governor can say, I'm going to do another one and, you know, automatically trigger another special session. The state legislature could extend it. So they can say, hey, governor, you don't have to decide this. We'll decide it and we're going to extend it for more time. Um, I suppose the state legislature could extend it for any amount of time if the governor decided to uh, sign that. That would be just a, a law that would be passed. Uh, but the most important question probably for figuring out how long this is going to last is that the state legislature or the governor can end it. So the governor can end it unilaterally as near as we can tell. This isn't common stuff. I think World War II was the last one that we had um, that lasted for any amount of time. Uh, the state legislature, though, can also end it. But in order for the state legislature to end it, both chambers of the uh, legislature at the Minnesota level would have to vote to end it. So the House, the, the, controlled by Democrats at this time, as is the governor, it's a Democratic governor, uh, and the Senate, uh, controlled by the Republicans, would have to vote to end the peacetime emergency. So last Friday, um, the peacetime emergency declaration took effect, the extension, and the Senate, again, the Republican-led Senate, voted to end the governor's powers. Uh, the House voted to not end the governor's power. So that was the end of the question. Both chambers have to vote to end the peacetime emergency declaration or else it continues uh, until we get to the next time and then the governor might have to call yet another special session if the legislature isn't still there. That's not the only question though, uh, as far as how long the eviction moratorium will last. Eric, if you could switch the slide again. We also have the federal question. So the CARES Act, uh, which most of us have heard about, the CARES Act is not just about landlord-tenant issues. It's a tiny piece of it, but it is a piece of it. Uh, the CARES Act is federal legislation passed in March this year, uh, and it stops landlords from filing evictions or charging late fees. By the way, the governor's moratorium, the Minnesota moratorium, does not stop late fees. Um, but anyhow, it bans eviction filing for non-payment of rent only. So... If we didn't have the state moratorium and a landlord wanted to evict for a dog and the tenant's not supposed to have a pet according to their lease, the landlord could file the eviction for that. But for non-payment of rent, which is again, well over 90% of all Minnesota evictions, uh, a landlord wouldn't be able to file right now because A, there's a state ban on evictions, but B, there's this federal ban. And we'll talk about who it applies to in a second, but let's just talk about the dates as well. So the CARES Act, uh, stops a landlord from filing an eviction up until July 25th. 
Uh, and then the landlord has to give the tenant a 30 day notice saying, hey, I can file an eviction against you because I've warned you with this 30 day notice. Hopefully the tenant will find out how much exactly they owe. So they can go to some sort of social service provider or their church or family or friends, try to convince them to uh, help cover the cost of the eviction. Um, I, I imagine that's the whole point behind the 30 day notice given by the federal government. But anyhow, uh, under the CARES Act, a landlord can't really file an eviction if they're covered by the CARES Act until very late August of this year. Uh, so it was effectively a um, five month moratorium on evictions that the CARES Act created. Uh, but the CARES Act doesn't apply to everybody. Let's look at who it does apply to. Eric, thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm guessing Eric is multitasking. Yeah, I know he's got a couple of kids uh, that he's keeping an eye on at home right now. So uh, anyhow, uh, the CARES Act, who is covered? So the easy questions are places where there's a federal uh, subsidy of some type and everybody knows about it. So public housing, project-based Section 8 housing. Uh, if you have a, a Section 8 voucher, that, that's covered. Low-income tax credit properties. Um, but the hard part is the second bullet point here, properties with federally backed mortgage loans. So these are properties that uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac have federally insured. Um, almost impossible for a tenant to know the answer to that question. Uh, the, the second bullet point, does this property, this one to four unit property, have a federally backed mortgage loan? Um, it, what we're seeing in other states where eviction doors have opened up again, where landlords are now able to file evictions, is that the courts are requiring landlords to swear under oath that they are not covered by the CARES Act if they're trying to file an eviction for non-payment of rent. Uh, I have to assume that if, if the eviction doors open, let's say on July 14th, the governor decides not to extend the peacetime emergency declaration, that Minnesota courts would be asking the same thing at least until the CARES Act um, protection uh, for tenants is gone. Uh, because that person is probably the only person in the world who can actually get that information uh, quickly enough to be meaningful. Uh, and just like a landlord has to swear under oath that everything they're writing in the eviction papers is true, they, under penalty of perjury, uh, under the current system that we have, uh, that could be tacked on as sort of a requirement that a landlord would just have to say, I'm not covered by the CARES Act. This question, as near as we know, hasn't really ever been asked before. How many people would be covered by the CARES Act? Because the CARES Act didn't exist until March of this year. Um, and so we're guessing somewhere between 20 to 50 percent of Minnesota rentals are covered by the CARES Act, which is a giant range. We understand that. But uh, that's just, our, like I said, our most sensible guess based on the information that we have right now. The governor has extended the peacetime emergency declaration several times now. We're starting to close in on uh, not, not wondering whether the CARES Act will create a separate question or not. Uh, at some point, if the federal state moratorium goes past where the CARES Act is, is involved, this will be a, a dead issue. But for right now, if the legislature decides to end the peacetime declaration or the governor decides to end it, somehow the eviction moratorium at the state level gets lifted. There's still this potential question that every landlord is going to have to answer for a non-payment of rent case in Minnesota, which is going to be almost all the evictions that they're going to want to file. Um, so anyhow, we're trying to make sure that, that everybody understands that there's two hurdles today for a landlord to file an eviction in Minnesota right now. And they're separately created and they have separate sort of time limits on them, but they are both hurdles that if all the uh, state eviction protection went away, we'd still have this in place. All, all right. right. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, so, Eric. Um, sorry for my delay there. I am multitasking. Uh, it's nice to have two screens. You can do a couple things at once here. Um, Okay, so we did get a number of questions submitted in advance, and I'm seeing a couple that have come in via the chat and the Q&A, so we'll get to those. Uh, and sometimes these are uh, questions that Mike's already answered, but we'll, we'll go through them again. Uh, so the first question, anything, did anything else change with the July 13th extension? 
Not really. Again, the week before that, the governor had expanded when a landlord could file an eviction. It used to say uh, if a, a tenant was seriously endangering the safety of other residents, and that language was tweaked to include others. So just kind of this blanket phrase, others on the premises. So again, that would count neighbors that live there, but also uh, the landlord themselves, the owner, their, their employees, somebody making a delivery, um, you know, the plumber comes by, anything like that would still, uh, a guest of any other uh, tenant would count as well, I would imagine. Uh, I haven't seen any cases trying to interpret exactly what that means. It's a brand new rule, you know, a week old or whatever. Uh, but uh, that's the only other change in the last couple of weeks that makes a huge impact on uh, the, the governor's moratorium. Um, but no, it's a good question to see if there are any other changes, but mostly it's just an extension of what we already had. And then a, a very similar question, is the eviction moratorium still in effect? If so, when is it set, set to expire next? Yep. And I, look, people are, are smart to ask that question in advance to make sure that we get to it. And I don't mind going over this sort of thing again and again, because this is the part that matters the most. The state eviction moratorium expires on July 13th. Again, that can be renewed. Uh, the CARES Act effectively stops a landlord from filing an eviction if the CARES Act has a rule um, until basically the, the end of August, August 25th or so, is when a landlord can file an eviction if the CARES Act is in place. So July 13th or August 25th would be the two answers that you can give that are both today correct, but who knows if there will be an extension of the state moratorium. I have yet to hear any meaningful um, indications that the CARES Act will be extended. Um, that was passed in March, a lot of bipartisan work done at the federal level, which isn't a phrase that we say much any more bipartisan work at the federal level. Uh, but again, the CARES Act was passed by Democrat-led House, a Senate-led uh, Republican, uh, I'm sorry, Republican-led Senate, and President Trump, a Republican. Uh, so again, very bipartisan work. Uh, and uh, I, I fear that the motivation behind uh, that kind of bipartisanshipness uh, at that point in time in March is nowhere near what we have right now. So I think the CARES Act is, if I had to bet, I would bet is not going to be extended. The Minnesota uh, moratorium on evictions, I think that's kind of anybody's bet. Uh, and people ask us all the time, you guys must know what's coming. Um, you must have the ear of the governor's office or know exactly what's gonna happen next. And we get confirmation of everything exactly what everybody else does. When the press conferences made clear. Um, sometimes we get indications, sometimes those indications are wrong. And so uh, we've learned to trust it when it's officially announced. Um, and, and, you know, we don't really have any inside secrets to spill, to be honest with you, as far as how long we think the governor will go. Again, we could guess about it, but it's a meaningless guess because uh, I think the governor is trying to look at the information that's present the day of the decision each time. Say how many cases are there, how many COVID-19 cases, and, and look at the trends and, <clears throat> and talk to the scientists and the doctors and try to get the best information they can at the time. So it's pretty difficult for the governor to say today, yeah, on July 12th, I'm going to renew the uh, peacetime emergency because I know it's going to be that bad by then. I mean, that's a long ways away uh, time-wise from the governor's perspective. So I think that they want to decide as late as they can. But um, again, we don't have inside information telling us definitively what's going to happen. We just, we just don't know. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, these questions are part of the reason why we're doing these uh, webinars weekly because there are, there are changes on a weekly basis in the past, past two weeks, uh, you know, tw executive order 2073 that slightly alters the suspension uh, was put into place and then also the, the extension. So, and, and I guess the week before that, we had the Minneapolis ordinance change that we talked about on, on this show, uh, which we're not talking about today, but th there have been a lot of changes in landlord tenant law um, in, in this uh, four month period and uh, there, there's more to come. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the next question that was submitted in advance, does the ongoing eviction freeze also prevent landlords from terminating a tenant's month-to-month -month lease? 
Yeah, so, and this is something that we were talking about uh, that the Attorney General's Office is starting to look at more. Um, a termination of the tenancy or termination of the residency uh, is something that uh, has come up and it's banned by the eviction moratorium from the governor's original executive order. So in my mind, this will happen in, in two settings. One is what was just asked in the question, a month to month lease, which traditionally, uh, if either side doesn't wanna continue the lease, all they have to do is tell the other side in writing with enough time, hey, I'm not renewing your contract right now. That's it, that's all that has to happen. And then the lease is ended, but that's a termination of the tenancy. And so in a month to month setting, uh, it's pretty difficult for the landlord to terminate a tenancy right now. Uh, certainly they can't, if, again, as I mentioned, if they've given a notice to vacate for the end of May or a termination notice for the end of May and the tenant's still there on June 1, the landlord doesn't have much of an option to kick the tenant out. They can't file the eviction for holding over. Uh, but the bigger question is, can they give a future notice? Again, today, June uh, 17th for the end of July, under the governor's order, I think they can't, and it sounds like the attorney general's office thinks that they can't as well, although we've yet to see a case filed on that specific topic. Um, so probably not is the short answer, at least probably not legally. It doesn't mean landlords aren't trying it, but whether or not a judge would ever enforce that is a different question. The other type of non-renewal or uh, notice to vacate is at the end of uh, a term lease. So if a tenant has a lease that ends the end of uh, June, a one-year lease or a two-year lease even, um, or even a three-year lease. We see those now, especially since more single-family homes are rented than they used to be before. Um, can the landlord say, hey, your lease is ending, so you have to go? Some of those leases, by the way, those term leases still require a notice by either party, a month or maybe even two months notice at the end of the, the term. Uh, but what if that term is over? Can the landlord force the tenant out? Same question that we had with the notice to vacate. Uh, is, is that a termination of the residency? And if so, uh, probably not legal. And I think it is. It sounds like the Attorney General's office believes it is as well. And so it's probably not something that the, um, the landlord can do. Now a tenant, by the way, does have the power to uh, give a notice to vacate if they wish to go. That's clearly covered by the governor's order. It was something that we, um, in the original shelter in place order, it wasn't clear if a tenant could move at the end of the lease or if they'd given a proper notice. But uh, it has been since modified, a tenant is uh, clearly allowed to move in or move out. Uh, it's the landlord declaring that they must move uh, that the governor's order essentially tried to stop. Yeah, then a somewhat related question. Can, uh, and I th this was sent to me via email. I'm not sure if it was meant for this, this uh, today's or tomorrow, but we'll answer them both uh, on both days. Can, I think this came from a landlord. Can you increase uh, the rent if a tenant is on a month-to-month -month lease? That's a hard question. Um, there's a lot of legal nuance to that. Uh, our, our office believes that no, uh, a landlord cannot do that. Here's why. Um, whenever you have a lease for any amount, whether it's a one-year lease or a month-to-month -month lease, the, uh, there's sort of key elements of that contract. One is the address. Two is the amount of time. And three is the amount of the rent. Okay, those are kind of the three main components to pretty much every lease. They have those three pillars that everything else is kind of built on. And if, if a landlord decides to raise the rent, um, whether it's a month to month or at the end of a term lease, they are changing one of those three pillars. And there's no rent control in Minnesota, although there is a rent or price gouging law, a governor's order um, that stops any kind of increase over 20% for something that's a necessity like this and housing is included for sure. Um, so if there's a giant price increase, that's clearly uh, a violation of the governor's order. By the way, that penalty is much more severe than the trying to terminate a tenancy, which is $1,000 uh, or up to uh, 90 days imprisonment. This is $10,000 per time that a landlord does it uh, if they price gouge. Uh, but I still think it's a termination of the tenancy because it changes one of those three core pillars of every rental agreement, the, the actual address, the price, and the duration of the contract. Um, so if a landlord is, is unhappy, they're stuck with a one-year lease uh, at a certain amount, and they think the market will pay a lot more for that place, 
uh, I think they're kind of stuck until the governor's orders are over as far as raising the rent goes. Um, not saying that we're not seeing rent increase questions on our tenant hotline, but to be honest, uh, we haven't seen them like we have in pr prior years. Uh, COVID-19 has had a strange impact on every part of the housing market. And uh, although we've only heard of a couple cases of rents being lowered, we're hearing a lot of calls where the rent is staying the same, um, which hasn't been the case in the last seven, eight, 10 years where rents have been going up sort of steadily and sometimes dramatically depending on the market uh, conditions in that specific area. Um, so rent increases we're seeing less of anyway. I think they're occurring naturally less because landlords are realizing, wow, I want to keep good tenants that are actually paying the rent on time. Um, and uh, I think that more apartments are emptying out. Tenants, if they don't feel, feel like they can afford their place, they're living with their parents or doubling up with somebody else if they can. Maybe health reasons have them living with somebody else. Either they're sick or somebody they know is sick that needs help. Uh, so rent increases uh, are, are down as a call reason for us since COVID-19 kicked in, um, which like I said, had been sort of marching steadily for probably close to a decade now. All right, so... Um... Uh, wh why don't we take that clarifying question uh, that somebody just sent in, if I may clarify, are landlords not allowed to increase rent at all currently? Um, this particular person, Alexandra, looks like is a tenant and uh, is renewing their lease soon and the landlord is increasing it, the rent by 3%. Uh, our view is that the landlord is not allowed to increase the rent. Again, we know the land landlords are doing that. I would file a complaint with the, the attorney general's office saying, hey, they're changing my rent. That's one of the core pillars. It's like they're ending my lease by changing the rent. Um, and see if the attorney general's office will step in and tell the landlord, hey, hold off on your rent increase. If I'm a landlord, I'm not going to give any rent increases right now until the governor's eviction moratorium has ended. I think that's just the conservative move. Uh, at this point, because I think the landlord here is terminating that contract by doing that. All right, um, a question, okay. Re regarding rental assistance, uh, the state legislature has been debating about a variety of uh, rental assistance and other issues. Is there any way that renters or landlords, small business can go to federal agencies to seek to seek some sort of assistance, financial assistance? Um, or call the state housing office and apply? Yeah, I, I'm looking at the same question that I think you're looking at here, Eric, and there's a reference to something called the Montana plan. I have to confess, I don't know what that is, which is a little embarrassing because I'm, I'm from Montana. That's where I grew up. Uh, stayed there till I was done with college, but uh, I don't know the Montana plan. Um, and I don't know of ways to sidestep um, or to, to, to access money, certainly not for landlords. And for renters, it's the same sort of uh, types of places that they've applied before. Um, but I'll tell you my starting advice when it comes to a tenant that is asking about, hey, is there rental assistance available to me? Which is that uh, I, I always want them to call uh, the United Way's 211 service. Their referral system is the most up-to-date. They keep, I mean, that's all they do is refer people to places that, that they think line up with what is available. So they keep the most current database of what's available. Sometimes it's geographically hinged. Sometimes it's you know specific um, other factors that they know that money might be available for certain groups. Um, and so they'll, they'll steer you in that direction. And our, our office is nowhere near what theirs is as far as keeping an up-to-date referral system on that because they do it so well and we rely on them to, to be able to do that. Right, a couple other sort of related questions, um, rent strike or rent withholding. Mm -hmm. uh, so since many tenants uh, cannot pay anyway, or others may be wishing to organize and withholding for repairs until there's not a public health emergency, um, why couldn't large corporate landlords just sit on their debt for 12 months, convert it to debt? Um, small landlords could get grants, um, uh, but larger corporations who've been profiting could could wait it out for the common good. So it's kind of a policy question more than anything. Yeah. Do you want to try this one? Yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a good point uh, that's that's raised. I I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's been there's been some federal legislation, I think, proposed as follow up to the CARES Act in the House, at least that I think passed that that was going to actually put a moratorium on on rent for yeah the heroes act um for for 12 months um and i think it also did some stuff related to debt and 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 also in terms of uh the reporting of of rent debt to credit agencies because that will be impacting tenants as well um but yeah there's there's you know i, th I don't think there's not widespread agreement unfor um, unfortunately at, at a federal or even a, a state level as as the previous question got to uh, about how to deal with this um, and then there's an, another follow-up question uh, citing uh, in Quilinos Unidos why does why does so this is a community organizing tenant organizing group why do they expect that rents would be suspended without converting it to personal debt for the family and I'm not not sure what the answer to that question is either. Um, do you have anything? Mike? Well, I, look, I don't want to try to answer. First of all, I'm not exactly sure what IX is saying to folks. Um, and so to, I, I can't verify that part of what they're saying, nor can I say why they would uh, expect rents to be suspended. Um, again, if there was a law saying that rents are going to be suspended, we'd see it. Uh, and we have not seen it, not at the federal level, not at the state level, not at the county level, not at the city level, not at the neighborhood level. Tenants have been talking about rent strikes since COVID-19 started. Uh, and I don't fault tenants for bringing it up. Hey, look, we're not sure we're going to get paid because our jobs have disappeared. And so we're going to go on a rent strike, which, by the way, is not a traditional rent strike. Most rent strikes that we've seen in the past are the, the tenants band together because repairs aren't being made or they've just decided that the rents are so exorbitant that they're not gonna pay them. This motivation for the rent strike, the COVID-19 motivation seemed to be spurred by, hey, wait a second, we've lost our jobs. It wasn't our fault. It wasn't like we didn't show up to work on time. We just lost our jobs because they disappeared. And so we shouldn't be penalized as tenants. So we're not gonna pay our rent. Like I said, it's not really a traditional rent strike. It's kind of a rent, I don't have it. A uh, rent strike implies that the tenant does have the money and they could maybe put it in an account somewhere um, and then have their rent paid eventually if certain conditions are met. But that's not what this kind of rent strike is. This is really rent cancellation, rent forgiveness uh, is the right phrasing of it. I'm not sure if branding is really the key question here, but I haven't seen any legislative um, indications that this is gonna be something that's real. Uh, again, tenants have been asking about it, I think kind of hoping for it since this all began, but that doesn't make it solid ground to stand on either. And so uh, maybe IX has a more thorough answer of how they think that a rent strike is going to work, not just maybe, maybe legally isn't even the question, maybe just kind of morally, but uh, when this comes down to a court situation, it's going to be the legal question that the courts are going to try to figure out. So. Yeah, I, I get the frustration from tenants saying, hey, why doesn't a rent strike work? Why do we still owe rent if we can't afford our rent? Um, understood, but again, the rules that we have in play, the governor's order really explicitly says rent is still due. It wasn't left vague. We're not guessing about what the governor meant. It's really clear that rent is still due. Uh, it's just that the landlord can't use the eviction to file the court case. Yeah, I, I I know also that um, there. Ha I mean, there's been groups that have asked the governor uh, and even proposed, you know, new executive order language to to do that type of thing, like uh, uh, cancel rent um, and and a number of other things. And you know that we haven't seen it, that happen. There's been there's been some slight changes, like we've talked about on this call to the. Ex the 2014, um, but but nothing nothing major as of uh, as of yet. And th that's actually a sign that the rent cancellation or rent strike is even less likely. It's not like it hasn't been proposed. Um, it's been considered by the people that make the decisions. I I guess the governor could have. Wow, I mean, trust me, the governor's uh, decision to continue the peacetime declaration is not popular everywhere. 
I mean, and by the way, it's not just evictions. It's not the only thing it, it matters for. There's other areas where the peacetime declaration has an impact. But uh, the eviction thing is a part of it. Um, and uh, if the governor decided to say, hey, rent's canceled as well as part of the orders, it would be an even stronger um, pushback from uh, whatever it is the other side is comprised of. I don't think it's all one party because landlords aren't just Republicans, but landlords would be uh, very upset about that because they'd say, well, who's paying our mortgage? Uh, well, they probably have a longer time to come up with the money. They still owe the money eventually, probably under the rules that we have. So unless that's going to be forgiven as well, there's going to be a domino effect uh, and somebody's going to owe something. Um, it's a matter of how to reapportion that. The reason why the rent strike, the rent cancellation, the rent forgiveness um, movement hasn't, in my mind, sustained itself because it was really very vocal in early March but that was before the federal stimulus money started coming out. That was before the unemployment um, sort of booster cash from the federal government started happening. And that was all very theoretical and people were really and legitimately concerned that they were gonna be able to pay April's rent at all. Some of this extra money started coming in, people realized they had the money available to pay the rent and then it was just a matter of, you know, could they afford to pay the rent and still get groceries and everything else and medicine and whatever they needed. And most tenants were able to find that they could pay the rent. Um, there are reports from all around the country, but the one in Minnesota put out by a, a group called the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, one to maybe 4% increase in delinquent rents from this time last year, which is actually pretty substantial. I don't want to understate that because um, that's a big number. It's usually a pretty solid number. You go month to month, you look what happened in May of last year, what happened in April of last year, because it's sort of seasonal. Um, and so a one to 4% increase in delinquent payments is bad, but it's nowhere near what we had thought might happen when all these uh, unemployment federal stimulus things were floating around sort of in the ether and nobody was sure how real they were, when the money was gonna show up in accounts or a check was gonna be sent. And that probably explains why the rent cancellation, the rent strike talk has uh, not sustained itself like it had at, at, at the beginning, or maybe there's just less press coverage, I'm not sure. Uh, in my mind, the next real test for this kind of thing is uh, the end of July, when the federal unemployment booster money uh, is set to sunset, basically. And so I think there's a real concern that that's when we're gonna see people unable to pay the bills that they need to be able to pay um, much more than it's hit us already, that that uh, federal money, along with the stimulus money, has put a pause in the um, potential tsunami of evictions. But uh, the end of July might be when it all hits. And there's a sort of a follow-up question on this that you you got to a little bit, but you know, mm -hmm. does does Homeline know how much rent is not is being not paid in Minnesota? I think it's a really good question, and I think honestly my perspective is, is that so, some of the media reports that have, have looked at this have, have not really taken a, an appropriate of enough glance at the situation. They're, they're looking at um, some, you know, larger operators like uh, larger proper, property management companies that, uh, you know, that run a specific kind of subset of housing in Minnesota. There's, there's close to, I think, 650,000 renter households in the state. And, you know, if, if, if only one, one percent is behind, that's 6,000, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a huge uh, population of, of re renters that are not really being covered in, in some of that, the media coverage that, that we've seen about this issue. You know, we, we get a, a good number of calls. We, we probably are talking to 50 or more tenant households a, a day. Um, and we are hearing about situations where people are unable to pay rent. We, we, we don't, there's, there's not some sort of magic way to find out what the number is, but, um, but it, 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 yeah. it's significant and, and every month it gets more precarious, right? Right, right. And, and I mentioned one to 4%. That's, that's the increase in delinquent rent payments from the year before. The actual uh, what percent of people are current on their rent is somewhere, depending, according to the survey that I'm citing, it's somewhere between 88 and 92 or 93 percent is current. 
So like you just pointed out, there's 650,000, maybe 700 or even more thousand rental units in Minnesota. And uh, every percent is six or 7,000 that are behind, right? So if we're six to 12% behind, we're talking a lot of people that are behind in rent, a lot of households throughout the state. And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit next week. Um, I'm actually working on a, a speech for a, a different organization, but I'm gonna be sharing some of the results that I have. We're gonna talk about predicting the wave. Um, is going to be the session that we're going to cover next week, how big we think the number of evictions that will be filed, and not just filed, but filed essentially all at once, might be. Um, and I, I don't have the firm numbers right now, uh, and it is going to be a, a best guess anyway, but uh, that's something we're going to be talking next week's session. So uh, it feels weird to plug that because it's a, a dire thing. But yeah, we're going to be talking about that number and how we're coming up with that number and why it's such a big concern, especially um, as a, an attorney that, that works with tenants throughout the state. My concern has always uh, been real about the eviction process, which is it's just a steamroller for a lot of tenants. And if we have a massive increase in evictions that happen all at once, I'm very concerned that tenants won't be able to stand up in court and say, hey, wait a second, I have a legitimate defense. Uh, if there's, you know, hundreds or thousands of cases happening that same week, the judge might not have time to listen. So we'll talk about that next week at length, uh, what we think the, the number of evictions might end up being. All right. So let's jump over to this question that came in. Um, I, it sounds like this is coming from a tenant. Uh, I haven't paid June rent or May or June water. My landlord is saying they don't have the funds to pay water on my behalf and water may be shut off by the water company. Is, that, is this allowed? It's a little bit tricky actually. Um, probably not would be my short answer. So the bill is in the, I'm not sure if the bill is in the tenant's name or not. That actually makes a pretty big difference in this situation. If the bill is actually in the landlord's name, uh, the tenant could essentially pay whatever they owe in rent to the water company. And now obviously they may not have the money to pay that, but that's an option to force this going forward. Um, but yeah, this is one of those situations where the facts are gonna matter a lot, the specifics of the facts. And uh, I would, <clears throat> ask, and I know this person that sent this in is anonymous, but I would ask you to contact our tenant hotline um, either on the phone, uh, it's free, or email an attorney, or email an attorney service, because um, we're going to have to dig into the details of your specific question to be able to answer it, um, to see whether or not I think that that can be done or can't be done. Uh, there's too many factors that are too hard to know based on the question that you have here. Sorry, not trying to dodge a question, we just need a lot more information to be able to advise you correctly about that and, and location oops yeah in location might might play a factor yes. here too i'm putting in the chat hopefully um like for example in minneapolis they, they've they've stated uh that they're not going to be shutting off water service for unpaid bills during the pandemic uh okay so we got another question that came in all right lease ends june 30th landlord gave notice in mid-april stating he will not renew the lease and can't stay as month to month. Lease does call for a 30 day notice of non renewal. Is that notice of non renewal allowed? This is not, this is not subsidized housing. Okay. Leave that on the screen for a second. Cause I'm still following it along. Uh, I think this one. Yeah. The chat. Yeah. And this is one of those questions we've sort of been bouncing around a couple of times today. I think that the landlord cannot enforce that that notice to vacate for the end of June because they gave it during the peacetime emergency declaration. If I'm the tenant in that situation, I'm gonna file a complaint with the attorney general's office. And you can do that either online or you can call the AG's office. Again, that's free for a tenant. And they can say, hey, this isn't legal landlord, you gotta back off. Um, and that's what they do. They send letters or they make phone calls to landlords telling them they need to withdraw this uh, non-renewal. And that's clearly fall falling smack in the middle of the current peacetime declaration, which doesn't end until July 13th. So yeah, I think a landlord cannot do that uh, going forward, yeah. All right, um, and okay, uh, question from Carlton. If a landlord offered 
a non-rent paying tenant a cash payment, let's say two months payment to move, would that run afoul of the peacetime emergency? You sometimes see buyouts and mortgage foreclosure cases for the bank to get around the redemption period and take possession sooner. Yeah, so, so we call this cash for keys in general. That's really a blanket term for a lot of these situations, but Carlton just explained that this happens a lot with banks and banks do this in foreclosure situations. They'll actually pay people to go because it's cheaper than going through the process. Uh, yeah, I think a landlord could do this. I don't know why they couldn't. Um, right now, the landlord does not have the power to file an eviction or to remove the tenant, but the tenant has the power to go. They also have the power to retain possession, which is sort of, I guess, if you want to think about this from a law, law school perspective, that is a right the tenant is in possession of. Can they sell that right? That's really what we're asking here if we're thinking about this kind of uh, theoretically. Can the tenant sell their right to possess? And I have to think a court would say, sure, a tenant has the right to sell their right to possess the rental unit. Um, I, I don't know what magic number there is uh, of, of dollars, but can a landlord pay a tenant to go right now? I think they can. I don't know why they couldn't. Um, yeah, I think otherwise the tenant doesn't have the power to vacate is, is, is sort of the converse or inverse of that. Uh, and the tenant clearly does have that power. So I think that would be legal to do. We haven't heard of that much in this uh, COVID-19 era. Um, I've seen it over the years. Some landlords, instead of filing an eviction against a tenant, will actually offer the tenant money to go. Um, even if the tenant owes a bunch of money, they, the landlord figures that this is the easiest way to get the tenant out. It's going to be faster. And landlords are almost always nervous when they file an eviction against a tenant or give a notice of non-renewal that the tenant is gonna be that one that they read about in the paper every couple of years that destroys the place on the way out the door. Now that almost never happens, but it does happen. So that, that promise of payment right when the landlord gets the keys uh, gives a landlord a little more peace of mind if they're asking the tenant to go, especially if it's at all um, confrontational. Uh, and so some landlords like that concept of buying the tenant out of a lease. Like I said, even if the tenant owes money, um, so yeah, I think a tenant, long, long answer to a pretty direct question, I think the landlord could buy the tenant out. Uh, if I'm a landlord, I'm going to want to get that in writing. If I'm the tenant, I'm going to want to get that in writing too. All right. Uh, we got a clarification on the water question. Water bill is in property address and no name attached by the city that this person lives in. The landlord pays in advance and the tenant reimburses the landlord every month. This is in Cambridge, which is a nice sandy county. I'm not sure if that... Um, yeah, I still want the tenant to call in directly. Uh, the landlord paying in advance every month means that it's not the tenant's bill. And so there's a way to probably work this out through the utility company or the city. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to talk to the tenant themselves on this issue. There's just... This, uh, <laughs> I've done this long enough to know when a generic question is answerable and when it isn't. We, we need to actually have a hardcore conversation with the person to make sure they get the right advice. All right. So I think that's all the questions that well, we some had. in the chat, I think, aren't there? I thought I got to all of them. If you see, sorry. I see a couple. I see one. Does, uh, does Homeline know how much rent is being not paid in Minnesota? Yeah, yeah, I, we, we well, that. that's yeah. kind of a different question actually versus the number of delinquent payments. Mm -hmm. Um, if you think about it for a second, I mean, what I mean here is it's one thing to not pay your rent for June. It's another thing if you haven't paid your rent since um, March, right? You didn't pay April or May. I talked to a landlord yesterday who, uh, giant portfolio, um, and uh, the number of non-payment tenants, so the, the percent of, rent, of apartments that weren't current was really low. It was like 1% of her uh, rentals weren't current, but pretty much all of them owed all of the rent since the eviction moratorium was put in place. So several months. So if you looked at the percentage of rent due versus the percentage of units that were not current, uh, it was much higher, the percentage of rent that was due in the overall portfolio that the landlord had. And so it, it is a slightly different question. And it's, it's, I don't think it's just an academic question either. I don't know how to know the answer. I mean, you can ask every landlord that same question, the, the conversation I had with a landlord yesterday um, and see what they say. And I'm guessing it's gonna vary a lot depending on sort of the, the type of place they have and where it is. 
and who their clients are, right? Who the customers are, their renters, uh, the, the more tied into one employer, for instance, in you know, uh, a smaller town in greater Minnesota, if that place goes out of business, then that can have a much bigger impact on that landlord where in a city where there's multiple different types of employers, it's, it's maybe more um, diffuse the impact on a landlord. But yeah, I think it is a different question. I think it's a good question to ask. I'm just not sure how to answer that one um, going forward. And there's another one I think I see from Linda about, she's Saint asking Paul. about the St. Paul tenant protections. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna put the link in the chat. Hopefully that worked. Um, and while I'm doing this, I'm also gonna put up on the screen just a final thank you and a reminder about next week, if I can figure out how to do this. Uh, there, thank you, is it up there? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, Linda asks in the chat about uh, these proposed St. Paul ordinances. So again, um, we did last, was it last week or the previous week? Um, in early June, because on June 1st in Minneapolis, a series of tenant uh, landlord ordinances became effective. Uh, those were number one, a cap on security deposits. Number two, a uh, regulation of the sort of the, how, you, how a landlord can use tenant screening, what, what things they can look at and how far back in terms of uh, credit score, evictions, et cetera. And then also there was some, some relocation assistance uh, ordinance that, that became effective. Those are all law and, and current in Minneapolis for almost all landlords. There's one uh, exception for the tenant screening regulation, which uh, is, is only effective right now for larger landlords, landlords that have, I think, 15 units or more. And in December, uh, it will be effective for, for all landlords. Um, so, and then currently, so that's all law in uh, current city ordinance in Minneapolis. Um, in St. Paul, uh, the city council, this is not yet law, city council is considering a, a series of, uh, or it's one ordinance, but it's sort of a series of tenant protections that uh, impact tenants and landlords. It is, uh, I believe, getting heard to this afternoon in about an hour, there's a council meeting. And I think uh, the, the link that I provided in the chat, once 3.30 rolls around, you'll be able to, there'll be some sort of live video button that you can click on. Uh, but the, they'll be considering these ordinances. And then I think potentially uh, next week, there'll be a public hearing in a, in a formal vote. Uh, but today they can review them and amend them if they want to. And the, the things that the St. Paul ordinance proposes, proposes to do is fairly similar to what is current law in Minneapolis. It's got a security deposit limit. Uh, it has uh, guidelines for how landlords can do uh, screening of prospective tenants, similar to, to Minneapolis, slightly different. And again, it's it all, all is up for debate and, and amendments and changes. Um, it's also, creates some protections around the sale of affordable housing um, that's defined in the ordinance and giving tenants advance notice if their apartment is going to be sold and some protections for displacement around that. Um, and then uh, and then the other large thing that it does that's, that's different than what Minneapolis has done is it creates just cause notice requirements uh, prior to eviction or termination of tenancy. And so that those are laws that um, that many tenants currently have in subsidized in certain types of subsidized housing in our state right now. Um, residents in manufactured housing uh, in Minnesota have just or good cause uh, termination requirements under state law, but there um, for, but but uh, most other tenants that are not in in one of those situations, subsidized housing or. Um, or in manufactured housing do not have. And so right now, well, not, not right now, but in, in normal times, pre-pandemic, pre you, you know, a landlord could give a notice uh, to terminate a tenancy and not, re not have to be required to explain why. And so what St. Paul's proposing is setting that up. And, and the, the link that I shared has that information, uh, has, has uh, the text of their, their proposal. And again, 
just a caveat that, th that this is not law. This is something that they're considering over the next couple of weeks here. Anything else to add on that? No, the just cause is the thing that's the biggest change from the Minneapolis approach. Uh, th there are differences as well. The security deposit limit is different. Uh, the screening is different as well, but they're, they're close cousins to what Minneapolis, but the just cause is the uh, sort of the standout one that seems to be getting all the attention. Yeah, so, uh, so up on the screen, I, I do have the reminder that next week we'll, we'll be doing uh, sessions again on Wednesday and Thursday, Wednesday for tenants and Thursday for landlords. And Mike's going to go a little bit more into detail unless there's significant uh, legal changes between now and, and next Wednesday. Um, we'll be covering uh, sort of an attempt to predict the, how many evictions will be filed. Uh, all right. Well, it's 2.30. Anything else, Mike? I think that's it. Thank all you right. all for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. And we will call that a day. Thank you.